Hi, everybody. This is lecture two in our series on the trivium, that is, the first three of the classical liberal arts, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. This is our only lecture, in fact, devoted to grammar, and you will find online all kinds of, I'm sure, far, far more comprehensive sources on this topic. Today, I want to talk just about uh, the parts of speech, syntax, and diagramming sentences. This is a, a really fun activity and picks apart our writing in a way that can help us to strengthen it very much. Let's get started. On the title slide here, we have the eight parts of speech. Now, of course, these are things that we know, but our purpose in reviewing these is to really understand what are the basic building blocks that we're going to be working with in this course, especially as we move on to rhetoric and logic, our later topics. We know that there are eight parts of speech. We start with nouns. Nouns refer to a person, place, or thing. Um, dog, rabbit, and road are examples of this. This chart is taken from the textbook by Hauser. Verbs include actions and passions. Passions, uh, it's an interesting term, comes from the Latin word passio, means to suffer or to undergo. All right, so if I have a passion for something, it means that I, I love it so much that it's as though it just pulls me along. Right? That is my passion. Uh, we also talk about something like the passion of the Christ. Verbs can either refer to actions or to things that we undergo. Adverbs modify verbs um, or also adjectives like certainly or suddenly. Pronouns um, stand in for nouns. We have a variety of pronouns listed here, both subjective and objective. Adjectives modify nouns. Um, and interestingly, even the is an adjective because you're specifying which of the uh, instances of that noun you are referring to. Prepositions introduce a descriptive phrase, so into, down, and from are examples of prepositions. These are really important connectives that enable us to construct more complex sentences. And the same can be said of conjunctions, which bring together various clauses or portions of a sentence, including and, or, and but. And then there are interjections. Oh, yes, say. These are examples of words we use that just kind of add flavor and, and add, uh, they might be important in rhetoric to add energy to a sentence. Um, from Hauser, we have this example of a sentence that, conclude, that includes every part of speech. Well, she and J young John walk to school slowly. Right, so well is an interjection. It's not really adding to the meaning of the sentence, but it's adding to the kind of tone of the sentence. Um, she and young John, so we have here a pronoun, a conjunction, an adjective, and a noun. Then we have the verb, um, a preposition, and uh, what, where they walk. Um, and we'll see kind of how sentences are put together with subject, verb, and object um, presently. Just to refu uh, uh, introduce a few other details about these parts of speech, nouns include proper, common, abstract, and collective nouns. Knowing that can help you understand how to logically deal with the nouns or terms that you include in an argument. Adjectives and pronouns we've discussed. Verbs um, include both transitive verbs and intransitive verbs, and we discussed that in lecture one when we talked about the different kinds of arts, the practical and the fine arts being transitive. You're working with an object, something outside yourself, um, whereas uh, intransitive verbs pertain only to yourself. We use the example of the rose blooms. So in that case, you're not doing something to an object, and yet some action is occurring. Adverbs modify a verb, as in the example of quickly, um, and prepositions, as we said, introduce an explanatory phrase and can also stitch together different parts of a sentence, just like conjunctions. Um, and interjections, as we've said, um, add flavor to the sentence. Okay, so those are the eight parts of speech. If you want to know in English what a sentence is made of, those are the basic units. Now, what we want to do <clears throat> is take those units and put them in order such that we can convey meaning. 
to a listener or reader. Um, and that is the area of syntax. Now, here we have a diagram for the sentence, the boy chases cats, or not properly speaking a diagram, but we're identifying the parts of that. Um, and in a moment, this uh, diagram will become clear to us. We're going to look at the parts of a sentence. Take this example, he paints posters. This includes a subject, a verb, and an object. And every sentence in English needs to include a subject, a verb, and an object, even if some of those might be implied. Uh, so in this case, he is the subject who or what performs the action of the verb. Right? So you, you have an agent. Uh, you also have a verb. Um, in this case, it is a transitive verb because he is doing something to an object outside of himself in this case. And you have an object, whatever or whomever is receiving that action. As complex as a sentence is, you can always look for the subject, the verb, and the object. And doing that is going to help you to cut through uh, the uh, complex prose that you might encounter every day online, elsewhere, and determine, okay, what actually is being said here uh, once you leave out all of the other perhaps rhetorical elements of the statement. Um, subject, verb, and object uh, do not have to be single words. So we have here on the top, I like chocolate. That's like the last one, he paints posters, just one word for each. But in the second example here, we have the professor I told you about rejected my research proposal. So in this case, the professor I told you about is altogether itself the subject. Right? Verb rejected, in this case one word, my research proposal. That altogether is the object. So when you're looking for subject or object, you might be looking for more than one word. Same case below, uh, the woman next door, subject, sells, verb, her homemade pancakes, object. So we're able to look at any sentence and identify which part of the sentence corresponds to which of these um, elements. Now, <clears throat> we've talked about subject, verb, and object, uh, but there's a more fundamental kind of distinction we can make, and that is between subject and predicate. Right? Because the verb and the object together are acting to give you more information about that subject or to tell you something about the action of that subject. You are predicating something of that subject. You are attributing something to that subject, in this case, an action, right? So the subject is the person or thing performing the action. It's usually a noun, sometimes a pronoun or a noun phrase, as we saw in the last slide, and it usually comes before the predicate. But uh, if you talk like Yoda, you might say, um, uh, let's see, subject before the predicate comes, right? Uh, did I get that right? Anyway, <laughs> Yoda tends to reverse subject and predicate, and that's characteristic of, of Yoda's speech. Um, the predicate indicates the action performed by the subject. It contains the verb, but also everything else in the sentence. Everything you are claiming about that subject is made uh, together makes up the predicate. Take a look at this. Um, so, our business offers discount rates. So here you have a, a subject phrase, simple one, our business. Which business is it? Well, it's our business. And this business offers discount rates. So all of that information, offers discount rates, makes up together the predicate. It includes the verb, offers. It includes the object noun, rates. Um, but it also includes an adjective, which modifies rates and tells us what kind of rates the business offers. Um, so you can divide this into subject, verb, object, um, or you can divide it into subject and predicate. All of this is going to be important when we get to logic, which is why we're covering it now. So here's, a, here's an example that we used in the last lecture, but we can take it apart a bit and, and look at its components. The cat sat on the mat, right? So you have your noun phrase here on the left. That is your subject, the cat. Then you have your verb, sat, right? and then you have uh, your, um, well, the cat sat, I guess it would be just an action. The cat can simply sit. Uh, but uh, we know where the cat is sitting, and that is indicated by the prepositional phrase, on the mat, right? So the subject here is the cat, and sat on the mat is the predicate. 
That's all of the information that this sentence gives us about the cat. Let's talk about diagramming sentences. Um, there's, there's a wonderful book about this. I forget the title, written by a sister from some decades ago. Um, but it's a, a wonderful activity. And, and I remember when I was in school, there was some talk about diagramming sentences, and I, I found it to be incredibly boring. <laughs> but since I've started teaching it, I found it to be I found it to be incredibly interesting because however complex the sentence is, you're able to discern the structure. You can kind of like an x-ray, just look at the sentence and see, okay, what is most important in this sentence, right? Now, everything we've been talking about already helps you to do that, knowing the parts of speech, understanding subject and verb and object and, and subject and predicate. Um, but this is going to help you do this even for very complex sentences and to see the relations between every part of a word. Okay, so John runs. When you're diagramming a sentence, you want a baseline, as we have the horizontal line going across. And in this case, you have the subject always in the upper left position. You always start with the subject, the agent, the one whom or about which the sentence is. Hmm, that was a strange construction. The subject goes in the upper left. The verb goes after the subject, and you indicate that it's a relation between subject and verb by placing a vertical line that goes through the baseline. John runs. Simple sentence, subject and verb only, line going through. This one introduces two new elements. Here you have students quietly read books. Students is the subject. It goes in the upper left position on the baseline. You have the verb, read, right? So you place your line going straight down through the baseline. That's a vertical line going through the baseline. And you place your verb, read, right? But in this case, you have an object. They're not just reading in general. They're reading books. And so to indicate that you are um, uh, placing the object on the line, you use another vertical line after the verb, but you just do not go through the baseline. So the line between subject and verb goes through the baseline. The line between verb and object does not go through the baseline. Students read books. Now, in this case also, you have a modifier for reads because the students aren't just reading in general, they're reading quietly. You indicate a modifier, in this case, a, an adverb, by placing a, uh, an angled line below the relevant word, in this case, read. Right? So students read books and they read them, uh, modified by, quietly. Right? And that gives us the full map of this sentence. Um, now, this is still a very simple sentence, but we'll see later, um, as we go on to more examples, how pulling out the subject, verb, object in this way can be enormously clarifying in complex cases. Now, uh, we want to talk about, briefly, action verbs and linking verbs. Because right? an action verb, like we ride to school, um, shows an action. Something is happening. The subject is doing something. But there are also linking verbs. Um, and in this case, like the stew tasted good, um, the stew is not engaged in an action of tasting, right? The stew is simply the stew, um, but it happens to taste good. The linking verb simply provides more information. It, it links together what's called a subject complement. It tells you more about the subject. Um, there's a difference between action verbs and linking verbs that's, again, relevant to logic that we're coming up on later. Um, but let's see how to actually diagram this. In this example, we have teachers are effective leaders. So the subject is teachers. The verb is are. We place our line going through the baseline all the way through to indicate that. Then, above the baseline, we place an angled line uh, before leaders. Why? Because teachers are leaders. Um, uh, are there is a linking verb. Uh, teachers are not leadering, right? They're not engaged in an action. Like, teachers lead students would be an action verb. But teachers are leaders simply provides more information about 
the teachers. Um, and here also we use a line to modify leaders because they are not just leaders, they are effective leaders. And so that modifier goes below the baseline uh, also with an angled line. Now here we have an example of a conjunction, right? So that's putting two things together. So I want to diagram that children read books and emails. Subject, children, line goes straight through, verb, read, right? And then because this is a direct object, we place a line above the baseline, does not go through, right? After read, and now we're going to give the object. What are they reading, right? Students read two things, books and emails. So you create that kind of divider, this, this uh, triangle thing, right? Um, and goes in the middle, and then books on top, emails on the bottom. If it was, you know, books, emails, texts, and posts, you could have a four-part division there. In this case, we only have two. But notice that you still have the line after read because you're still dealing with a direct object. It's only that it's a compound direct object um, joined by a conjunction. Dawn, my cat, ate her food. Now here we have a complex subject or a, a kind of noun phrase, right? Dawn, my cat. Um, so you don't have two subjects here, Dawn and my cat, because Dawn is my cat, right? So you would indicate that by placing the proper name of the subject, in this case, Dawn, um, along with, in parentheses, the phrase cat, uh, because that is what Dawn is. The sentence provides that information. You would also modify it with the angled line below the baseline with my, because it's not just any cat, it's my cat. So Dawn, my cat line through the baseline, verb ate, right? And then the direct object. What did she eat? Dawn, my cat, ate food, right? But not just any food, you modify it below the baseline with her, her food. Dawn, my cat, ate her food. Go. Just a few more of these. Um, the stunned crowd watched the bridge falling into the river. This is an example where uh, the sentence is a little more complex, um, still pretty straightforward, but there are lots of different elements to it. Uh, the baseline is going to help you to pull out that essence. It's like the, the skeleton of a fish. You're just, sorry to our, our fish friends, but you know, you're pulling out the essence of the thing um, and getting right to the point. Crowd watched bridge. Right? There, there's lots of other information. The stunned crowd what was the bridge doing? All of that is nice to know, but the essential point is crowd watched bridge. Okay, which crowd? The stunned crowd. And you see we put up there uh, modifiers below crowd to indicate what kind of crowd it is. We put our line going through the baseline to divide the subject from the verb, in this case watched. And then we placed a line above the baseline, vertical line, um, to divide the verb from the object, which is the bridge, crowd watched bridge. Very simple sentence. Now, which bridge was the crowd watching? Well, we need to modify, uh, or we need to indicate that there are some modifiers, right? It watched the bridge. So that's your first one. Remember, the is an adjective, the bridge. Um, and it also watched the bridge falling and then into. So we have two words that are giving more information about the bridge, and they're both modifying, uh, they're both Let's see, falling is modifying bridge. It is the falling bridge, if you want, right? But it's not just falling in general, it's falling into, right? So into, the preposition, is actually modifying falling, right? The falling bridge. Uh, and where was it falling? Into the river. So into is the preposition, it's modifier. Uh, river is, is on the new baseline there at the bottom right and the modifies river. So you're able to see how even in this still fairly simple sentence, but there's a lot going on, you can pull out the, the core, crowd watched bridge, um, but you can also add modifiers to show how all of the other information in the sentence relates to each other. Here's another example of this kind of complexity, um, and, and this looks a bit more complex, I would say, than it is. Um, Pedro hit the ball well, but he ran to the wrong base. So here you have a, a complex sentence that could in fact be two sentences. You could say, Pedro hit the ball well, Pedro ran to the wrong base. 
Those both make perfect sense on their own as sentences. But we don't have two sentences, we have one, joined by the conjunction, but. So this example shows us how to work with a conjunction of this kind. The first part of the sentence, Pedro hit the ball well, is diagrammed on top. Pedro hit ball, right? Pedro is the subject, hit is the verb. Oh, there's an error. There should <laughs> The line between Pedro and hit should be going down through the baseline. Did I get you? Yeah, no, no, that, that was a mistake on my part, not a test of you. So the line between Pedro and hit should be going down straight through the subject and verb, and then ball, Pedro hit ball. He hit it well, so we modify hit with well, and he hit which ball? The ball, so we modify ball with the, right? Okay, great. Now what we wanna do is link this up with the next, um, uh, for a clause, the next portion of the sentence. So we, we draw a line under that baseline, connecting it to a new one with the conjunction, but. Um, and in the next one we have, he ran, which is the main uh, thrust of that second part. It's what we need to know. Um, but where did he run? So we modify run with to, um, the base, right? So to base, and which base did he run to? Base is modified by the and wrong. So we're able to see we're dealing with a sentence that has two distinct parts joined by a conjunction and how each of the parts of those uh, clauses uh, work in relation to the others. Here's our last one, last example we'll look at on diagramming a sentence. I really do not know that anything has ever been more exciting than diagramming a sentence. Gertrude Stein. Oh, how delightful is that? So, I do know, right, is the, the basic uh, part of the, the, the basic meaning of the first part of that. Um, but of course, it's very significantly modified by uh, not, <laughs> which you see modifying um, the verb there, do know, um, and really, right? So I really do not know, that's the first part. Now we have a kind of conjunction, that, that is gonna provide uh, basically the statement that she is now going to say she does know, or in this case does not know. I really do not know that. And then we have on the bottom here a new baseline with a new subject, verb, and object. So we have anything has been exciting. Right? So anything is the subject of this new part of the sentence. Has been is the verb. And you see we have a vertical line going down between the subject and the verb. Exciting but this has been is a linking verb. We're just getting more information about anything here, right? In this case, exciting. So the line between the verb has been and the um, uh, object <laughs> is uh, angled because the has been is a linking verb as we saw above. Um, has ever been, so we add the modifier ever. Uh, and in terms of exciting, we have more and a comparison, than, right? So more is one modifier, and than is a second modifier. Uh, but than what, right? So this introduces a third baseline, the only example that we've had of three baselines in our lecture today. Um, than diagramming sentence, right? So diagramming there is in the subject position, sentence is in the object position, um, hence there is a line vertically going down between them, and sentence is modified by the article A, the indefinite article. So in this case, you see you have a complex sentence that has been mapped out, and we're able to kind of x-ray that sentence and understand the structure. And that, friends, has been my hope for our remarks today, that we understand how diagramming sentences work, not because this is itself such a crucial skill, you're gonna use this throughout your life, but because when we look at language, we're not just looking at how we feel about it, we're not just looking at you know, the, the impact that it has, we're looking at the structure of it. We wanna understand why it is constructed as it is, both in order to construct sentences more effectively ourselves and in order to better assess sentences that we hear so we can be better critical reasoners. All right, thank you very much. I'll see you next time.